Today I am very happy to uh, introduce to you Dr. Chao Sang. Dr. Chao Sang is a no stranger to myself. Actually, we were classmates. When we were classmates for five years as a medical student, because the class was very big, I never really had a chance to talk to him, even though he was in Group N and I was in Group M. After many, many years, we finally reconnected again. And gosh, I didn't realize that this man has grown so tall. <laughs> he has, because he went on to become an expert in colorectal surgery. And he became a, a head of department in a, a structural hospital. And after that, he left the, the government service and he started a colorectal medical group with a couple of colorectal surgeons and he's doing very well and I'm so happy to, uh, today that we have uh, the honour to, to get Dr. Chao Sang to join us Dr. Chao Sang, please Come take a seat, yeah Dr. Chao Sang, would you like to uh, introduce yourself to everybody because I find it very difficult to read your long CV <laughs> You should have given me a shorter one <laughs> Uh, thank you, Leong, uh, for inviting me, and thank you to AIA. First of all, uh, I don't have an Instagram account, so you can send your sci-fi pictures to <laughs> Dr. Lo. <laughs> My name is Charles. I'm a colorectal surgeon. Uh, I specialize in disorders of the uh, large intestine and intestine as well. And of course, um, the little round hole which Dr. Lau talked about, uh, that is also one of our areas uh, that we manage a lot. That's a very common problem uh, in Singapore. Many, many patients have hemorrhoids. Uh, I won't embarrass you by asking you to raise your hands if you have hemorrhoid problems, but I will take it that a lot of you will have it. Uh, so I've been a colorectal surgeon for uh, probably about 18 years now. Wow. Uh, and prior to that, I was a general surgeon, uh, and before that, I was training after gra graduating from medical school. So if you look at Dr. Lau, we are classmates. You can probably, he looks younger, of course, uh, but we are classmates and we, I've been in the business for a long, long time. But many, many years, 25 years in public service. I, I look younger because it's very tough to be a surgeon. They spend long hours in operation theatre. But what's more tough, what's tougher, is actually this man of all discipline choose to concentrate on that little round hole. I don't know what's so interesting about the little round hole, but maybe why, why do you choose to specialize in this, this kind of uh, you know, weird discipline? I mean, I would never do that. I imagine an eye surgeon always looking at the eye, ah, you know. The, I, I don't want to be dentist because, ah, smelly. <laughs> Some people just don't brush their teeth, but why that little round hole? Is there a, 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 something about your childhood, you know? <laughs> It's very funny. <laughs> I mean, the surgeon, you want to know, right? Right? Actually, you know, uh, when I was young, I'm Cantonese. How many of you are Cantonese? Cantonese, come put up your hand. So few. The rest are what? Teochew Nang? Ah? Huh? Hokkien Nang? Ah? Okay. I'm Cantonese, okay? So when I was young, my mother always say, you know, you better study hard. Huh? All the PSLE mums and dads. You better study hard, uh, if not, uh, they to si low, you know, you, you, you have to pick up the, the stools, you know. In those days, they used to uh, do stool collection through the buckets and all that. And now, how does that inspire you to be a colorectal surgeon? <laughs> I mean, well, I don't see the link. So I, uh, I said I would never ever be uh, to si low, you know. So, but, in, you know, life is very strange, you know, never say never. So I ended up in uh, to si low. <laughs> But um, I, I finished my general surgery training at a time when, um, at a time when uh, we first started off uh, the colorectal subspecialty in Singapore. So at that time, I think there was a, a, a need, and I think the statistics was already showing that colorectal cancer was going to be one of the top problems. Uh, facing Singaporeans uh, at that time. And that was way back in 1993. Uh, the unit was started in 1989 in SGH. And since then, uh, uh, we have many, many colorectal surgeons in Singapore. Because at that time, 
the government already foresaw that colorectal cancer statistics was rising. So there was a need to set up a specialized uh, unit starting in SGH to train colorectal surgeons. And now if you go to any restructured hospitals in Singapore, there is a colorectal uh, surgical unit. So jokes aside, Dr. Chao Sang actually is a man of foresight, isn't it? He knew that the incidence of colorectal sang cancer is going to rise in our time, so he chose to specialize in something unique. And because of that, and uh, many other colorectal surgeons, they, they started departments in all the hospitals. In fact, Dr. Chao Sang, you said that uh, colorectal uh, cancer is rising. I mean, is it really one of the top cancer? In, uh... um, statistically, for men, it is the number one cancer in Singapore. Uh, number for females, is number two. And uh, number two after? Breast cancer. After breast cancer. So, um, breast cancer is number one for females. So, you add male and females together, uh, it is still overall uh, the number one cancer statistics in Singapore. And what is the risk of a person like me getting a colorectal cancer? Uh, in terms of incidence, uh, your lifetime chance is actually, well, statistically, Probably one in about 50. One in 50. One in 50 to 60 patients may be afflicted with this. Uh, every year in Singapore, we have about more than 2,000 new cases, uh, you know, uh, affecting uh, Singaporeans. So that means that among us, there will be people who have got colorectal cancer or know somebody with colorectal cancer. So it's important for us to know today a, a, a little bit more about colorectal cancer. And uh, the sad part is there's a lot of, uh, you know, myth and superstitions about all these uh, colorectal conditions. And one of the things that uh, I would like to see people doing is to have more selfie about your own, uh, your own body, the most hidden part, but we don't see that. This is a selfie of uh, Dr. Loli. This is a selfie, seriously. I want to post it on my Instagram. <laughs> it was actually taken a couple of years ago, a colonoscopic photograph taken by my good friend as well. And uh, I'm proud to announce that. Am I right? It's clean, right? It's very clean. Yeah, it's very clean. And you know what I did after that? When I got this report, I went to eat char kway teow. <laughs> as human, you know, you've been dieting for so long, finally. Wow, I've got a clean slate of hell. I got to eat char kway teow. Why is it that people don't want to go for colonoscopy? Is it because the surgeon is rough or is it because it's really dangerous? I think uh, um, awareness probably is the, the, the most uh, important uh, contributing factor. A lot of people uh, are not aware that uh, just going for a colonoscopy screen can actually help you prevent uh, cancer. That's number one. Number two is that uh, a lot of patients are put off by the colonoscopy exam because of the bowel preparation. So the preparation is actually quite tedious to some, and also it's, it's quite hard to drink, right? I'm sure Dr. Lauli will, will tell you that. Actually not true, no. I, I, as a doctor myself, I always have the preconception that it's very difficult to drink. But nowadays I find that it's quite tasty. And <laughs> I'm serious, I'm serious. I, I actually had this bias, I thought that it's quite uncomfortable. And I imagine that after drinking, I will have wow, cram, you know, and then rush to the toilet. And I actually plan for the day when there's no one at home before I go for it, because I thought I will occupy the toilet to, all to myself. So you don't really need to worry about that, because I think the cram nowadays is not so bad. Am I right? No, it's, it's, it's not a cram. There's no uh, cram at all? No cram. It's just an urge to, to go, and I, I think uh, you will go quite quickly. And, and, and the other thing I noticed is when I went through that, I felt so light after that. And ladies, if you would like to lose weight, this is one way, you know, to lose weight. You go for a colonoscopy, and after that, it feels so light. And I know that there are lots of ladies who like to sell on spa packages and go for detox and all these things. Those are dangerous stuff. We'll talk more about it later. But this one is actually cleaning up your whole power so that when Dr. Chao Sang goes inside, he can take beautiful photographs. <laughs> and make sure you book him and tell him my own HD, all right? And then pass him your hand, your iPhone as well. 
I, I know there's an iPhone adapter now uh, to connect to the scope. Huh? But seriously, do you have to be awake when you, you get the, the scope done? Uh, nowadays, it's routine to give uh, sedation. So you'll be very well asleep when we do the examination. So um, you will not experience pain. Uh, and of course, there's a bit of amnesic effect. So you won't really recall much of the unpleasantness of the procedure. So uh, when you wake up, it's a very pleasant uh, experience that you have, have actually have a good sleep. And uh, Dr. Lau is actually correct about losing weight. You know, uh, do you know that you will lose at least one to two kilograms? That's a good motivation <laughs> for ladies. It so tells you that a lot of people are full of crap. <laughs> but it's cost a factor actually. Is it very expensive to, to for you know an ordinary person to afford? Uh, actually, the government, uh, Singapore government, MOH, uh, since September 2011, has actually made a screening colonoscopy uh, payable by Medisafe. So, if you can use your Medisafe up to 1,250 Singapore dollars to use for screening colonoscopy, this is, of course, to encourage Singaporeans to come forward for screening starting from the age of 50. But do you recommend it to everybody? Or is it a certain age group? Uh, about I'm the sure age of 50. So as long as you... I always tell my patients, in Singapore, 50 is a very important landmark year because that's when the government cuts your Medisafe, uh, Medis CPF contribution. So when you are 50, your CPF contribution gets cut. So that's the year you should remember, you should also go for a colonoscopy. How many of you have done your colonoscopy? Not a lot, Richard had. That's quite sad. You, you should seriously consider going for it, especially if you're as old as me. Now you know my age. Because it's very difficult for you to convince your client to go for it if you have not gone through it. Even as a doctor last time, I, I find it difficult to persuade somebody to, take, to go for certain tests if I have not even experienced it. But if I've gone through it, I know it's quite comfortable and he's right. I actually had a, one of the best sleep ever in my life. I woke up, I feel so clean, I feel so light, suddenly I passed my IPPT. <laughs> I mean, two kilograms lighter, you know, you can really spring, you know. So maybe the guys, if you're going for a reservist, you can consider before the IPPT. Seriously, it's not expensive, you can claim to Medisafe as well. I think that's one thing that you can get the message out because this is probably one way that can really prevent colorectal cancer. Am I right? We can come yes. to that more later on. Actually, Dr. Chow Sang plays a very important role in, uh, in the well-being of uh, Singaporeans. You, you, you guys, a lot of Teochew down here, am I right? Do you, have you heard of the, 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 the phrase that says, uh, to, to be blessed, uh, you must be able to eat, right? You must be able to sleep, right? And the last one is what? Ah, what? Bang, uh, yeah. Correct or not? I mean, you cannot eat. You get all the money in the world. What's the point? You drive a Porsche, Ferrari. What's the point? You go to the most expensive restaurant. What's the point? You cannot sleep. You can have a most luxurious bed. It's useless. Right? You feel lousy. And the last one, if you eat, you can sleep, but you cannot. SH1T. This is how doctors uh, use the word in the hospital to be polite. You cannot go to the toilet and open a bowel. Basically, it's miserable. The whole day, you say, ah, tummy bloated, ah, a lot of gas. Lah. Then you, you feel uncomfortable. During a meeting, you just do this side. Ah, do that side. Ah. Then you're scared. People can't, you know, didn't smell it. But actually, they do. They're just not, you know, not polite to tell you. That's all. So Dr. Chao Sang played a very important role. And, and that's why I want him to tell us about uh, you know, a little bit more about poo because from the poo next time when you see Dr. Chao Sang, please take a picture of your Instagram of the poo and show him maybe send him first by WhatsApp this is a Bristol score alright and uh, doctors have uh, charted this as a you know, way for you to profile your colo col uh, colonic health and uh, why is it that there are people who got constipation Dr. Chao Sang? Um, constipation actually means uh, uh, different things to different people so when we talk about constipation, we need to go back and ask yourself, what is your usual pattern? Okay, so what is usual for one person may not be usual for another. But classically, there are 
three types of constipation or two, two, two main types of uh, symptoms. One is that you have no feeling of going to the toilet. So I have patients who feel that they have no urge to go and use the toilet for even a week or two. Okay? And then and that's they, normal. That is that is abnormal. So by definition, if you go less than twice a week, uh, we think you have a problem. So some patients don't have the feeling at all. Uh, so they don't go to the toilet because they have no urge. Another group of patients who are also considered constipated is that they have the urge to go, but it's very hard to come out. You know, it's like trying to move your bowels through a closed door. So the ring, the circle is closed. It doesn't open up. So the trap door is, is jammed, we say. So you have the urge to go, but it's very hard to get it out, and you spend a lot of time in your toilet. Uh, much longer than the time that Dr. Lauli talked about. So you spend a lot of your time in the mornings or in the daytime in and out, in and out of the toilet, but you just can't seem to do a good job. It's incomplete. So is constipation one of the signs of a colorectal cancer? Uh, yes, it is. Unfortunately, by the time our patients do get symptoms of constipation, uh, it is considered a very late sign. And so what are the, the early signs that uh, you know, our audience can take home with to tell their clients? The, the, the earliest signs, probably one of the earliest signs is usually bleeding. Bleeding? So, yeah, bleeding is probably seeing blood in your stools is probably one of the early signs. So are you saying that if somebody has bleeding, you, you cannot just say, oh, I have pals and just ignore it, you know, or go see a Chinese sensei? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of patients have pals in Singapore, so a lot of them do mistake their symptoms of bleeding as uh, from pals, and that's where the danger is. So uh, usually, if your bleeding goes on for a period of time uh, without any recourse, that means it doesn't get better, you should always go and see a family practitioner just to make sure that there's nothing else uh, going on uh, inside. But I have to make this point. Only 10 to 15 percent of patients with early colorectal cancer, and we talk about early colorectal cancer, we are talking about stage one. Only 10 to 15 percent have symptoms. So if you flip it around, 85 to 90 percent have no symptoms in the earlier stage, which reinforces the fact that by the time you have symptoms, it'll be too more, late. Uh. It'll be too late already. Yeah. So don't wait for bleeding to occur. How about any other symptoms or signs that they can look for? Can they like feel a lump, you know? Uh, yes, but usually the lumps uh, usually will imply that the tumour is very, very big. Uh, so by the time you feel a lump, it's like quite late. Yeah. So it's still good to look at prevention. So we talk about prevention later. Let's look at the stool again. You know, if, if you've not seen a picture of the stool, I know some ladies and some men don't like to see the picture of the stool, but get used to it. It's natural. Okay? Post it on Instagram. <laughs> Alright? And then if you have a type 3 or 4, 4 is right, the, the, the most, the best. This is the most natural. The easiest. Go in only 2 seconds out already. And the guy who says, uh, I spend many hours probably the one at the top. Number 1 or number 2, you know? The constipated one take a long time, and the other group of people are the one who soft stool go and come in, come out, keep going in because it's soft, pasty, very irritating. So take a picture of your stool and uh, look at your stool. Is it type three or type four? If you got uh, any other stool and got bleeding, go and see Dr. Chow Sang, or maybe get a, uh, some other screening done. Who are the people who get uh, colorectal cancer? Um. Am I prone to it? Well, anybody above the age of 50 is uh, prone to it. That's why we start the screening program starting from the age of 50. By and large, most patients are in their 60s and 70s. By and large, I would say then uh, about 75% of our patients are in that age group. Uh, so the importance of this group of people is that the colon cancer is believed to take place from a polyp, which is a benign precursor lesion. And this polyp takes about 10 years to grow and transform into cancer. 
So if your patient is in the 60s or 70s, there's a picture of the polyps there. 10 years earlier will be in your 50s. So that's why we start screening at the age of 50. But this only for 75% of colorectal cancers. In the remaining 25%, we now have learned a bit more about colorectal cancer. In the remaining 25%, is usually due to another pathway uh, associated with genetic mutations and usually there is a very strong family history. So the take home message should be if you are 50, you should get a self screen. You need to know who your aunties, your uncles, your relatives are and you need to know whether they have a history of colon cancer. If your family has a history of colon cancer, your risk becomes even higher. Uh, so there's a picture of the, the polyp down there. One that's flat, the other one has a little, you know, stem, we call it pedunculated. The poly is basically like a little tumour, like cauliflower, you know, inside. And uh, you, when you do a scope, you can see that, and Dr. Chao Sang will be skillful enough to pluck it out and take it out early. So, like what you say, you should know your family members. So this is one good opportunity for you to visit your relative during Chinese New Year. And one of the messages you ask them is, Auntie, uh, uh, auntie you have no one who has a rectal cancer. <laughs> you have, then you know, then you know that your risk is higher, right? I think colorectal cancer does pass down the gene. That's what you're trying to say, am I right? And how about your lifestyle? Uh, lifestyle is important. Um, we always say you should um, eat less, move more. Eat less, move more. That doesn't sound very familiar. <laughs> Yeah, so obesity, obesity actually is uh, associated with an increased risk of uh, colorectal cancer. And how about food itself? Is there like certain food that you know, will make you a higher risk? For example, some people say taking more meat you know, is yeah. bad. How true so, is that? Yeah, so red meat, red meat has been associated with a higher risk of uh, colorectal cancer. It's, uh, it's supposedly dose-related, so if you are taking red meat, processed meat, preserved meat, so you know lah, Mei Zhen Xiang and, and uh, Chinese New Year, you know the bakwa that you no, eat, no those are actually meat. not very healthy, from, not only from the point of cholesterol, but um, the, the burnt ends, some people like the burnt ends, right? You go and eat char siu or you go and eat the siu yo. You always say, I want the burn end. Actually, the burn ends will contain a lot of carcinogens. These are cancer causing uh, agents. So, does preserved meat? Preserved preserve meat, meat yeah. uh, has a lot of nitrosol compounds, which is also cancer forming. So, preserved meat will be your lap chong, your dried sausages, um, some of the lap mei, you know. So, all these have certain chemical changes. Uh, that will pre predispose you to, to cancer. So the healthy food to take will be all your natural fruits, vegetable, right? Am I right? And then you, you are supposed to uh, lead a non-sedentary lifestyle, so you have to exercise more. Drinking and alcohol do play a part. What's your view on that? Yeah, so again, the, there are some data from the American Institute for Cancer Research that uh, increased alcohol some consumption uh, is a significant uh, risk factor for increasing your risk for colorectal cancer in males, specifically for males. Uh, I don't know why, but for women, it, the, the data is not as strong. So, uh, so the women seem to get away with it a little bit more. So for strong risk uh, modification factors, uh, one of the things for males is to reduce alcohol intake. So cut down alcohol and uh, smoking. And for female, I understand also that uh, female, if you have a certain kind of cancer like breast and uterus cancer, you're actually more prone to colorectal cancer. What's the reason for that? Uh, this will be in the, um, in the genetic uh, component. So there are what we call HNPCC families, hereditary, hereditary non-polyposis cancer syndromes. So these are cancer syndromes that will have a occurs in families or patients, and that includes uh, colorectal cancer, womb cancer, uh, thyroid cancer, uh, breast cancers. So basically, there are different types of cancers. If you have this syndrome, there are different types of cancers that occur in your family, and it's usually transmitted to a genetic mutation. So that's why the, 
the family itself is 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 affected. So it's important to find out the family history of your relatives. Uh, and it, of course, ladies, if you have breast cancer or uterus cancer or your clients have it, go for screening for colorectal cancer as well. And I understand that Chinese has it. I don't know whether it's because of the, the food they eat, the bak kwa, that's why we get more. Because the Chinese seem to have more cancer, colorectal cancer. Is there a reason for that? Or is it just because of genes? Um, I, I think dietary will play a role, but dietary and genetics, uh, you're right. In, in Singapore, if you look at the racial profile, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, the risk for Chinese is slightly higher than compared to Malays and Indians. Uh, you look at the cancer statistics. Uh, this is not influenced just by, uh, um, by our racial uh, 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 percentages. Even taking that into consideration, Chinese being more than any other race, if you are Chinese, your chances of getting uh, colorectal cancer is higher. So Chinese, all of you must go for your colon screening, huh? all right, especially if you are 50 years and above. How about the role of probiotic, let's say, if you really want to cut down the, your risk? Is that, does it really help, actually, taking more probiotics? No, uh, there's a lot of this in the pharmacy now. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, uh, Dr. Loli, uh, because increasingly the, the, the intestine is actually being treated as a very important uh, organ in our body. Uh, a lot of what we eat is being digested, which means that you also produce a lot of waste products in your intestine. So the time the waste product takes to move through your intestine, uh, there is what we call a transit and a contact time. And a lot of this uh, digestion, waste product uh, formation is related to your bacteria ecosystem. So there's been a lot of interest and uh, research done in this area, but it's believed that um, if your ecosystem is altered, uh, your bacterial composition is changed, uh, you will start to have a lot of bowel symptoms. So a lot of patients will have symptoms of bloating, uh, irregular bowel movements, especially if you had a cause of antibiotics. So we see this very commonly in patients who take antibiotics for whatever reasons, and then at that point in time, henceforth, they will have a start to have a lot of bowel symptoms. Um, so researchers are very focused now on uh, the byproducts, the bacterial composition, uh, looking at the intestine as an ecosystem. And as a result of that, uh, many people are advocating uh, taking a lot of probiotics. That means trying to reconstitute your, your gut uh, bacteria ecosystem to as close as what we think is, is normal. So of course there will be certain strains of good bacteria that are supposed to be good for your gut health and that's what they put into those capsules and all that. But I tell my patients instead of taking capsules you can just go and eat yogurt, uh, you know, uh, cheese, uh, take yako, you know, you can buy simple stuff over the counter uh, and that will be good enough rather than to pop pills. Go natural. So if you take antibiotics, you may be killing a lot of uh, germs. So don't take antibiotics unnecessarily for cough and cold, especially because it can disrupt your bacterial flora in the gut and it make you have a lot of symptoms, very uncomfortable. So if you can afford it, yeah, you can take some probiotics. Like if not, then take some yogurt. That's fine. I know the Indians love yogurt. It's very healthy. I also started taking probiotics regularly ever since I, I, I read about the journals and the, the usefulness of it. And ever since I find that I got less bloatedness and less colic. Sometimes because you are running around, you don't drink enough water, don't rest well, you get a lot of colic. So probiotic does help, especially when you're traveling. These are some of the things you can do. But some of the things that you must not do is that you read the paper about this TCM who do what? Detox, la, bowel wash out. Don't try that. They are, they are, they are what I call that, the cooks, all right? I know they put tube into your anus and then say you can detox you and all this, all rubbish. It's very dangerous, you may get perforations and uh, you, you should actually seek a professional advice and uh, you really want to detox, maybe a colonoscopy, you get the enema, you actually wash up thoroughly. These are the good things you can do, the healthy things that you can do to have a healthy uh, gut you know, flora. It's very important, okay? Let's go on to the next one. Other than colonoscopy, is there something else that we can do you know, quite easily at the GP clinic or at home? And uh, one of the tests we do actually, tumor marker called CEA, carcinoma embryonic antigen. Does it really help actually? Um, 
to pick up cancer, colorectal cancer early? Yeah, so CEA or carcinoma em em embryonic antigen is actually a very non-specific uh, tumour marker. So, which means that uh, a lot of other cancers can also cause a, a raised CEA. Um, if you smoke a lot, your CEA will be higher than a non-smoker. If you have an underlying uh, gastric problem, uh, your CEA may also be elevated. So, CEA per se as a screening tool is probably not as useful. The one simple test that has been shown to be very useful uh, in screening is actually the stool test, which Dr. Loli has shown here. Um, in a very large population study done in Minnesota uh, in 1980s, where they looked at 45,000 uh, population, they divided into three groups, 15,000, 15,000, 15,000. In the group that had stool testing every year, and they followed them up over a long period of time. In the patients that were diagnosed to have colorectal cancer, their chances of dying from the colorectal cancer was reduced by one third. So stool testing has been proven in large population studies to improve your chances of dying, not dying from colorectal cancer. So that is a very effective, simple uh, stool kit test. So stool screening for cow blood is one of the you know, things you can do, quite cheap. Go to see your GP, bring your stool along and get it screened. And if you're above 50 years old, go for the scope, colonoscopy, that will help you to pick up all these early signs early. And of course, uh, when you really need to get operated on, you know, is it really like what this picture says that every time you go for uh, cancer, you end up with a bag, you know, it's quite sad. Does it happen like this all the time? Uh, less than 5%, I would say, because only for cancers that are near the anus, near the ring, right? Uh, and if it's close to the ring, affecting the ring, uh, then we may have no choice but to take out the, the cancer together with the ring. And that means that you don't have a ring anymore to control your bowel movements. Then in which case, the stoma bag becomes a necessity. And, and for normal say, cases, normally let's say if you get to go for operation, how long do the patient need to stay in the hospital? Uh, nowadays, with keyhole surgery, patients only stay about three to four days. So it's quite fast, huh? Yeah. It's no more like the big scar like before? No more. So you get probably like uh, four or five small incisions, the largest of which is probably about five centimeters. That's to take out the cancer and the bowel. But all the other incisions like, are probably like five to ten millimeters, very small ones. So advance in medicine has uh, gone very far. In the past, I remember when I was a medical student, the surgeon used to take a big cut from here all the way down and pull out everything to operate. Now you just put a little puncture hole and you can go back within a couple of days, two, three days, right? So it's no more like before. But I think the catch and the, the, the take home message today is not really waiting for it to happen. It's how to catch it before it happened. So the take home message really is you really want to have hoped to live a good life, healthy life, you should exercise, eat healthily, take vegetables, cut down your red meat and all the barbecue stuff. And when you cross 50 years, get a scope done. In the meantime, every year, try to get your stool for a cup blood done. If your doctor order for CEA, fine, but those are not very sensitive. But if it's high, they probably investigate further to find out, is it due to colon or is it due to lung or something else that is causing it? But for a surgeon, of course, these are tools for them to use to measure the progress of the cancer. So really, today's take home message is about how to pick up colorectal cancer and then uh, hopefully you can learn from today's talk show and guide your clients and because really doc, uh, Richard talked about uh, rising healthcare costs I think the real and most uh, practical way about controlling healthcare costs is not to fall sick in the first place so ladies and gentlemen I think time is running out I want to thank you for your time today uh, let's uh, give a hand of applause to Dr. Carlton Thank you. I hope you guys learned a lot from them. 115 has a chance of getting colorectal pencils and uh, remember to go for screening, especially